Ready? All right. Good evening and welcome to our medical exercise MedEx Pro Summit. This is our first one. And as I've said earlier, um, the summit is designed to help you, or help us, I should say, establish guidelines for medical exercise training practices. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit over the next couple of days about protocols, uh, how to build your practice, how to market the uh, systems that you need to put in place. And the idea here is we want to see more of you build your own practices, move out of the health club settings, and set up your own independent private practices. Um, as you all know, I'm a physical therapist, and my encounter with personal training and medical exercise started some 19 years ago. If someone had told me 19 years ago I'd be here in Houston and we'd be broadcasting all over North America, I told them they were completely nuts. Uh, we had a situation, we had a patient, we referred out to a trainer. Uh, the trainer didn't understand everything we told her with regard to managing the client, and the client came back worse off. Um, and I have to be honest, myself and the physician that I was associated with at the time that referred the patient to me, we were livid. That evening, I had the, I guess the, um, I was lucky enough to have custody of my niece and nephew at the time. My nephew was in kindergarten. He was learning his ABCs. He was learning Bs that night, and, you know, a couple weeks earlier we had done Bs. Well, he kept making the Ds like Bs, and I became frustrated. And in my Frustration, I realized, hey, he's five years old, give him a break. And in that same vein, I realized the trainer didn't know how to manage a client with a uh, barstow uh, surgical repair done in the shoulder. So as a result of that, I was like, okay, we need to probably develop some guidelines as to how to manage these clients once we discharge them from physical therapy. I thought it was our, it was incumbent upon us to do that. As a result of that, we put together our first medical exercise specialist workshop. We did that in Washington, D.C. back in 1994. And we've done workshops all over North America since then. And now we have courses available on DVD or video or the Internet where you can now train from all over the world. The key thing that I want to get across now is with the idea of opportunities and the future of medical exercise training is just that. There are huge opportunities out there. Whether you like it or not, the changes in our health care system with the Affordable Health Care Act are going to be very important for you as medical exercise professionals. The idea of now being able to work with the medical community and being able to work with clients that refer is going to become bigger and bigger over the next decade. So as we go through this, we'll talk about opportunities, some of the things that you're going to see, and also talk a little bit about what we're doing here in our facility in Houston. As I mentioned earlier, uh, Jason Hodge is the owner of Medical Fitness Pros, which is where we now base our organization. And we're working with Jason to establish guidelines for all medical exercise training practices around the world. So we're going to use Medex, uh, Medical Exercise Pro, or Medical Fitness Pros, excuse me, as our, how would I say, our testing laboratory to see if all of this stuff works. So everything we're going to go over this weekend is stuff that we do right here that we have either are implementing or have already implemented. So let's talk about opportunities in the future for medical exercise training. First thing is we have to talk about what the, what the definition of medical exercise training is. Let me emphasize this and please write this down. You have to understand your scope of practice if you're going to start working with a medically based client. You have to understand your scope. Now, there's scope of practices out there for the physical therapist, for the chiropractor, for the physician, for the nurse, for the massage therapist. There aren't necessarily, there's not a scope of practice now for the medical exercise professional. So we need to make sure we understand what medical exercise training is. It's the development of safe and effective structured exercise and conditioning programs for clients with medical conditions. Notice it's an exercise program. MET includes, and that's what our abbreviation is for medical exercise training, MET includes the utilization of cardiovascular strength, flexibility, proprioceptive balance, and stability activities to enhance or maintain function. Please, if you would, underline this last segment, to enhance and or maintain function. Over the next decade, you're going to see more and more seniors that are coming to you with medical conditions that have been managed by their doctor, therapist, and or chiropractor. They've reached a certain level of function, and now your job is to maintain that level. Please write that down, to maintain that level. Mm -hmm. Maintaining a level of function for clients makes the difference between them going into a nursing home or staying home and being independent and maintaining their dignity. A lot of times we always want to progress clients. We want to progress the athletes, get them back on the field. Sometimes, though, with this new realm, medical exercise training, you're going to find the idea here is to hold the line and not let them regress, especially if when you work with your seniors and your clients with neurologic conditions. Remember, MET offers no treatment modalities nor diagnostic services. It's an exercise program. Okay? Our sole modality is 
exercise. Please, if you would, underline that. Here's the interesting thing. Exercise is a major factor in the medical management of a significant number of medical conditions. I'll say the majority. But it's something that's not significantly talked about in the medical literature, nor is it talked about in many instances by the physician community. Now, the physician community's lack of understanding of exercise is not a bad thing. It actually is an opportunity for you as a medical exercise professional to go out there and educate them about the possibilities of exercise. They understand exercise is important, but they don't understand the mechanics of it. So the biggest thing you can do is explain the following. You might want to write this down. What you do, how you do it, who you do it to, and when it's appropriate to do it. So what you do, how you do it, who you do it to, and when it's appropriate to do it. And that's with any product or service. Basically, you're defining who you are and what you do, how you do it. And here's the important thing. Please write this phrase down. Medfit speak. You've got to now tell them in terms they understand. You can't tell them in fitness terms. You've got to tell them in Medfit, medical fitness terms. In terms of doctors, the therapists, and the chiropractors understand. Okay? You're playing in their ballpark now. You're asking them to refer their patients to you, which means now you have to take into account you're playing on their field, so now you have to use their jargon, you have to understand their terminology, and you have to start to think like them to some degree. So here's the first thing I'm going to ask you to do. With this, on this slide, I'd like you to add, write down the following. You need to change your paradigm a little bit. You now have to start thinking medical exercise training first and fitness second. That's hard. One of our medical exercise program directors, he's probably listening in or watching in from Victoria, B.C., Richard Gafter, close friend of mine, very, very close friend. I spent four months in Victoria while we reshot our medical exercise specialist video series. And one of my jobs while I was there was to help Rich convert from a traditional fitness facility to a medical exercise facility. And Rich will tell you, I beat it over his head all day, every day, that clients were coming in for medical exercise, not fitness. Here's the, tradition, here's the typical scenario. Client comes in and says, I want to lose weight, but I'm coming to see you because my neck or my knee or my hip is bothering me. What they're really saying is, my problem is my knee or my hip. I can't do exercise because this thing bothers me, but I also want to lose weight. Please, if you would, make a note. Your job should be manage their condition with the exercise first and gradually incorporate the fitness and wellness aspects to get them to improve their fitness and wellness. Their problem is a medical exercise related problem. And when you start working with this client, make the determination, write these please down, what they need, how long they need it, how frequently they need it, and what the outcome will be. What they need, how long they need it, how often they need it, and what your outcome is. You ever notice when you go to the doctor, the therapist, chiropractor, they'll tell you, Mr. Holcomb, this is what we're going to do. We need you to come in X amount of times per week, go out and see the secretary and get scheduled. Right or wrong? They know exactly what they're doing. They already know what the outcome is. So if you would, please make a note. We're now going to start to look at medical exercise training from an outcome-based standpoint. Here's our outcome. We're going to look at your condition. And based on your condition, we're going to develop an exercise program for your condition. And the outcome is based on whatever the client needs. They have to go back to work. They have to climb the stairs. And they have a total knee replacement. Then in conjunction with their therapist and their surgeon, we want to now work on helping them improve their ability to climb the stairs. So if you would, please make one more note. The outcome is based on their functional needs. And we're going to use exercise to manage them. And if you would, please write down this phrase. Okay. We're going to manage the condition and we're going to train the client. This is one of the reasons we're having a summit. We're going to manage the condition. The management of that condition should be the same for Amanda in uh, Richmond, same for you, Brenton, in South Carolina, and the same for Jason Hodge here in Houston. The exercise management, okay, the medical exercise management of that total knee replacement should be virtually the same in every locale. But the client themselves may have certain issues. The client may also be diabetic, may be overweight, they may also have back pain. So what we're going to do is train that client. That's where we tweak the protocol to make it work for them specifically. So the guidelines are going to remain the same across the board. And this is where our medical exercise and post-rehab protocols come in. 
So we look at the idea of modality, the exercise being the sole modality. We can do a lot of things that, with that modality, depending upon the equipment you have, the facility you're in, the integrity of the client, and when I say integrity, their ability to perform certain activities. Over time, as you become more and more experienced, this will become easier and easier. So what is medical exercise training? MET is the utilization of exercise to manage medical conditions. If you would circle that one, underline it, highlight it. This is the most important aspect of what you're doing. You're using exercise to manage these conditions. You're going to see this slide later. Exercise is the key to long-term management of most medical conditions. The hypertensive client, the diabetic client, client that's arthritic, what do we tell them to do? Take their medication, do the treatment, and tell them to do what else? Exercise. In many instances, and I've talked to physicians here in Houston and around the world, they'll say the same thing. Well, we're not really 100% sure what exactly the exercise should be. But now we know with some of the changes in healthcare, this exercise component becomes more and more important. MET also manages the functional components of medical conditions. Please underline functional components. This means the loss of endurance, the loss of strength, the loss of flexibility, the loss of balance. Now these are the same things that the physical therapist manages when the client is in the acute and subacute stages, maybe some of the chronic stages. Your job is to manage them after the physical therapy and chiropractic and medical care are done and the functional components become even more important. If you would please, next to this statement here, please write medically stable. Medically stable. Client has to be medically stable though before they start with you. So yes, you're going to manage their medical condition, the functional components with exercise, but they have to be medically stable. That means their pain needs to be under control. If they're hypertensive mm -hmm. or diabetic, their blood glucose levels, their blood pressure levels, need to be under control. Their pain levels need to be managed appropriately. They need to have adequate range of motion and strength to begin an exercise program. What we want to make sure you understand is there are certain clients that are not appropriate for medical exercise. They need further medical treatment. MET is an essential component of the medical management model. This is going to become bigger and bigger, I guarantee you folks, over the next decade. You'll see with some of the statistics that we found out there, we predict that the idea of medical exercise training will grow well past the year 2020. Our population is getting older. I'm an example. I'm 52, well, I'll be 52 in a couple of weeks. I tore a rotator cuff not more than, what, six weeks ago, okay? I have an arthritic hip that will probably need eventually to have a hip replacement. I want to do, though, what at 52, what I did at 22 to some degree. I want to be able to play golf and do all those things. And at some point, I'll have physical therapy for the shoulder. Maybe I'll have a hip replacement to have physical therapy. But will I need an ongoing exercise program? Yes or no? Yes. So if you would, write down a statistic for me. Write physical therapy dash DC equals 80%. 80% of the patients that are discharged from physical therapy clinic need an exercise program. 80%. I think that's kind of low. 80% of those patients that are discharged from a physical therapy clinic need an exercise program. Now, I have an example. I have a brother. He's probably watching it over the internet now. My brother, Otis Brother Cornell. He's a football and basketball coach in the Washington, D.C. area. He had a hip replacement two years ago. Now, the hip replacement was done in June with the idea he'd be able to go back to school in September. But if you've ever played high school football, what happens on August 15th, every place in, in North America? Football season starts. He has his hip replacement. He wants to go back and stand on the sidelines and coach football. So after the hip replacement, he has two or three days of inpatient physical therapy. He goes home and has two weeks of home physical therapy. Then he has two weeks of outpatient physical therapy. Was he ready to go back and stand on the sidelines and coach? What do you think? No. His surgeon is at one of the large teaching hospitals in Washington. I knew this gentleman. So we called, talked to him a little bit, and said, hey, Let's refer him to one of our medical exercise specialists in the Washington, D.C. area, a gentleman by the name of Brian Ritchie. He's one of our program directors, one of our instructors. He owns Fit for Life, D.C. My brother went in to see him twice a week for about four weeks to get ready for the football season. Now, after they've replaced the hip, do you think he had the strength, stability, and endurance to go back and coach football? No. If he hadn't gone to Brian for that exercise program after he was discharged from physical therapy, what do you think would have happened along the way? My prediction is somewhere around the fourth or fifth week of the season, he would have said, what? This hip is just bothering me too much. I can't do it. His level of function required him to stand for an hour, hour and a half at a time. So we needed to train him to reach his level of needed function. 
and that's where medical exercise training came in. He had been discharged from physical therapy. Physical therapy was over. And please write this phrase down. He had received the maximum benefit from physical therapy. He now needed an exercise program, a safe, effective, structured exercise program with a medical exercise professional who understood the contraindicated activities, understood the related anatomy and pathology of his condition and his surgery, and how to progress him to the next level. Okay? Not heavy lifting or, or power type training, but appropriate exercise to get him back to where he needed to be. Fitness is somewhat nebulous. Medical exercise is finite. It's specific. This is what we're going to do for this client. We're going to, go, we're going to see the client twice a week for X amount of weeks. And then at the end of that period of time, the client needs more, we continue. Please, if you would, circle this. MET is finite. It's specific. We're going to work on this, this, and this. We're going to integrate fitness in there also, but we're going to work on specific things. Increases in range of motion and strength. Because here's the interesting thing. The medical community isn't nebulous. It's finite. They look at specific measures to determine if the client is making progress. The future, the changes in the healthcare delivery systems around the world, the aging of our population, and an increased presence of chronic disease has heightened the need for MET. Let me ask you, how many of you have been trainers at least five years? How many? Has your clientele changed? Have they gotten older? Do all of them now? All of them have something. When you find that client that doesn't have anything, you kind of look at them like, okay, let me, let's keep asking questions here. That's the client that's probably 22 and younger. The client that's over 30, they've got, everybody's, they've got something. It's, the, it's part of the human process. And that thing they have is the real reason they're coming to see you. It bothers them. It keeps them up at night. They're worried about their high cholesterol levels, their back pain. They want to do more, but they're not sure what to do. And the medical community has done well by them, but at some point the insurance carrier says, hey, it's enough. We can't pay for any more. So the changes in the healthcare system, what I mean by that, the changes in insurance reimbursement now are fueling this need for more medical exercise training services. And guess what? Guess who's embracing the idea? The need requires the collaboration of healthcare professionals and fitness professionals to improve health and wellness. Guess who's getting on board? Healthcare professionals. Okay? How many of you have actually talked to doctors that are like, yeah, I'll refer people to you? Yeah. They're now starting to realize this stuff really does work. Okay, and if you use a protocol-based approach and you talk to doctors in their language or therapists in their language, they're going to keep referring people. Because here's the interesting thing. You might want to write this one down. Exercise works. It's the best kept secret in medicine. It works. It works exceedingly well. And even with those clients that have multiple conditions and multiple involvement, if they start exercising, what's probably going to happen with them? They're going to get what? They're going to get better. Okay, it works. It works across the board. So, some of the foundations of medical exercise training. If we're going to talk about the future, we have to talk about what the foundations are. And the foundations are as follows. Yeah. As follows. Clinical anatomy. Please, if you would, underline this one. In our medical exercise specialist training programs, we find one of the biggest deterrents finishing the program is a lack of understanding of anatomy. We're not saying you have to be an anatomy scholar, have a master's degree in anatomy, but make sure you have at least a basic understanding of anatomy because Folks, quite honestly, this is what all aspects of medicine are based on. Now, we're not saying you're a medical practitioner, but we are saying if you're going to collaborate with the medical community, manage their, their patients, their clients, you've got to understand anatomy. Then, if you would, you've got to understand pathology. And please, next to this, write the following phrase, what went wrong? You've got to understand what happened with that arthritic hip. What happened when they had that knee replacement? What happened with hypertension or diabetes? If you're shooting in the dark and you have no idea what's going on with that client, can you develop an appropriate exercise program or more importantly, understand if the program you're developing is effective for them? You can. You also have to have obviously an understanding of exercise physiology. How is the body affected by the exercise you're providing? Please if you would next to this write disease management. I took a couple exercise physiology courses when I was in undergraduate school. I got a master's in biomechanics. It was primarily in the exercise physiology program. We learned how to manage the apparently healthy client. And then we also talked about cardiovascular issues. I learned all the stuff about orthopedics, neurology, that kind of stuff. I was in PT school. So please, if you would, the exercise physiology aspects, we also need to now understand what happens to the diseased client, the client with the hip replacement, with back pain, when they exercise. 
That makes a huge difference. So we know what exercises are working appropriately, which ones aren't. We've got to start to understand that. Hopefully we get that in our medical exercise specialists and our PRCS programs. I think most of you do because you're finding as you apply this stuff, it really works. Kinesiology, how the body works, what happens when we exercise? What happens when muscles contract? We've got to understand that. And the last one, biomechanics. I get this in a lot of our seminars. We get a lot of folks who understand biomechanics. What about the biomechanics of this? We will ask them about simple questions about anatomy, and they can't understand about they can't understand the anatomy, but they talk about biomechanics. Please, if you would write these numbers down: one, two, three, four, and five. That's the order that you need to learn these in. Anatomy is the most important aspect. You know what the biggest washout is for people that get into medical school or PT school once they get in? It's the anatomy. This is the most important. Everything in medicine is based on this. Everything. Gray's anatomy hasn't changed in hundreds of years. Because guess what? The human body hasn't changed. We estimate about 300,000. The same conditions we see today, the Greeks and the Romans wrote about centuries ago. Management processes have just simply changed. Understanding the pathology, how it, what happens when the things go wrong, is vitally important. Exercise physiology, the impact, the muscle contraction, and the biomechanics are all important. These are, the foundation, these are the foundations of medical exercise. We call these, please if you would underline these, the medical exercise sciences. As this grows, as the future of MET gets bigger and bigger, these five subjects are going to become vitally important. And you're going to gradually see exercise physiology curriculums change. You're going to see more medical professionals coming in and teaching classes on pathology. You're going to see more orthopedic surgeons and physical therapists coming in and teaching classes on biomechanics. And also, most importantly, how we manage these disease conditions. So medical exercise services includes the following. When we started 19 years ago, we started with just this, post rehab training. So if you would just circle that one. That's where we started. The idea was they finished with physical therapy, they went to the uh, medical exercise specialist. Simple, cause effect. They finished with PT, they went to um, uh, medical exercise, or what we call then post rehab fitness. If you would, just simply write the phrase here, less than one year. Less than one year. You'll see why in just a few moments. Over the years, we've seen a change in that now more and more of your clientele is what we call medical exercise. And if you would, next to medical exercise here, write greater than one year. I'll explain why in just a second. And then I know more and more of you are taking corrective exercise training classes. With the corrective exercise client, make sure that you start to see changes in that muscular imbalance or postural imbalance you're looking at. Make sure you start to see some positive changes. They can be very small within at least three to four visits. If you don't see them within three to four visits, go back and reevaluate. But remember this with the assessment process for that client that comes in off the street with that muscular imbalance. There are four possibilities of what can cause a postural and muscular imbalance. You might want to write these down. This is important. There are four possibilities. It could truly be a postural muscular imbalance, just muscle. Muscle is involved. We just need to strengthen it, stretch it. Strengthen connective or stretch connective tissue. So that's number one. Could be a postural muscular imbalance. But the other three kind of get a little bit more complicated. Number two, it could be a neurologic lesion. They could have a disc herniation. Let's say at L3. The L3 nerve root, and that disc is herniated at L3, it produces numbness, tingling, and pain in the quadricep. The L3 nerve root controls the quadricep. We've actually had patients come into our facility here. They've come over from the physical therapist, so they're our clients now. We actually had a young lady come in a couple weeks ago, well, last week, week before last, I think it was, with an atrophy quad and a weakened quadricep. Why? because she had an old disc herniation in her back. Now, if we looked at her and just simply said, oh, that muscular imbalance is just from the muscle not being strong enough, we could strengthen her all day, and guess what would happen? Virtually nothing, because that neurologic lesion is causing a problem. So number two, neurologic lesion. Okay. Number three, a joint disorder. There's a problem with the joint. I'll give you an example. A lot of people notice this when I teach our MES courses. By the end of the second day, they say I have a bit of a limp. I got three pins in my hip. My old parachute jump. I was a parachute for a while. 
jumped one time and dislocated my hip. I've got three pins there. As a result of that, I have a very, very minor, about a quarter inch leg length discrepancy. But along with that, I also have weakness of my uh, left hip internal and external rotators. As a result of that, standing for periods of time, sometimes my hip starts to bother me just because I don't have that same strength there I do on my right hip because of the leg length discrepancy. You can stretch me all day long because I have a tight quadratus lumborum. Is that going to change the, 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 the issues in my hip? No. Can you make me better? Yeah, but I have the joint dysfunction. So please, if you would, number three, muscular imbalances can be caused by joint dysfunctions. Things that are actually in the joint. Ligamentous damage, cartilage damage, whatever the case is. And then number four, number four is the one that makes everybody kind of pause with all of this. An organic lesion, number four. Organic lesion. There's a lesion in one of the organ systems. Anyone here ever had a relative, friend, family member have a heart attack? What's the classic sign of heart attack? Pain where? Left shoulder, down the arm. Okay? That's referred pain. Now, how many of you have heard of people having a, a pain in their shoulder and the doctor, therapist, chiropractor, or family members thought it was what? Just stiffness in the shoulder. Because last week I went out and threw the baseball or did something. Okay? An organic, please write this down. An organic lesion will produce musculoskeletal symptoms. I had a patient once when I was in a physical therapy clinic. Young lady came in, she was in her early 40s, came in with back pain, SI joint pain. We treated her with the idea that she had an SI joint issue. She was referred by a physician with that. By the third visit, she wasn't getting any better. Please, if you would, write that down again. Third to fourth visit, if they're not getting any better, you need to reevaluate. Reevaluate, and I go back to her medical history. Duh, at some point I realized, when was the last time you saw your OBGYN? It's been almost two years. Stop the presses. Go back and see your doctor. Lady calls us back about a week later. Guess what she has? An ovarian cyst. Okay. Once the cyst was treated, guess what happened to her back pain? It went away. So please, if you would, number four, organic lesions can cause postural, what we think of postural muscular imbalances. The key thing I want to get across here is with corrective exercise, it's great stuff, but make sure that you realize there's a 25% chance that postural muscular imbalance is just that. There's a 75% chance it may be something else. So if you would, please underline that third to fourth visit, we should start to see some positive changes. Not 100% they're better. We should start to see some changes. And this is when you need to go back. At that point, if they're not making changes, ask more, get more of a detailed medical history. Okay? If they do have a history of surgery, injury, trauma, just related to the postural muscular imbalance, start asking detailed questions. There may be more than you think. Here's the reason why I mentioned one year and greater than one year. We've classified our clients that we see in our medical exercise facility here. Our post rehab clients are clients that are within one year of injury, onset, or and or surgery. That means they had a hip replacement less than a year ago. They developed MS less than a year ago. Please, if you would make a note, that first year is the most important. That's why we classify them as a post-rehab client. These clients need a referral from their physician. They're a year or less. They need a the referral before they can start exercise. The medical exercise client, they're past one year from the injury, the onset of the condition, and or surgery. You see these clients all the time. Four or five years since their hip replacement. Five or six years since their back surgery. They just want to come in and exercise. Please, if you with, the, with these clients, make sure you screen them first. Do a musculoskeletal screening, get a good medical history to make sure they're appropriate for exercise, which leads us to this point. Is everyone a candidate for exercise? Not necessarily so. Some people aren't candidates for surgery. They aren't candidates for certain medications. There are some people that aren't candidates for exercise at that point when they come into your facility. But if they go back and they're properly managed by their medical professional, they come back three, four weeks later or a year later, they could be uh, appropriate. The corrective exercise client, no medical conditions, only muscular or postural imbalances are present. And if you would, circle this last one, the functional maintenance client. These are going to become your bread and butter over the next 10 years. Okay? That 50 to 75, 80-year-old client, they're still functioning, they're still doing their thing, 
but they need an exercise program to maintain it. You help maintain their independence, their dignity, and their function. Years ago, I had a patient. I was doing home health physical therapy. I had a patient. He was a gentleman about six foot six, 200 some pounds, really big guy. His wife was maybe five foot four. He had two arthritic knees, um, and he was a diabetic. If we hadn't been able to maintain his strength and balance and endurance, what would eventually happen to him? He could get up out of the bed. He could move around by himself. He could dress himself. He could use the bathroom, do pretty much all of his activities of daily living. What was going to happen if his level of function diminished? Who was going to take care of him? His five foot four wife. And I've had patients who are big men or women, and maybe there's a slender or smaller spouse. And remember, they're older, and he or she is trying to help the spouse get out of bed, and they both fall. What do we end up with there sometimes? Two severe injuries. So please, if you would, make a note. These clients are going to become more and more important to manage because we help control our costs in the healthcare system. They're going to become more and more important. Let me ask you, how many of you are seeing more and more of these folks that are coming in? Okay. They aren't going to make significant improvements. They aren't going to run the Boston Marathon or New York Marathon, that kind of stuff. But we just keep moving and keep, keep doing things. We had a gentleman that came in to see us with bilateral arthritic shoulders earlier this week. He's not going to suddenly be able to lift 150 pounds overhead, but if we can keep him functional, keep him at work, keep him doing what he has to do, minimize his dysfunction, that makes all the difference in the world. Mm -hmm. So these classifications of clients are going to become bigger and bigger, and this category is going to start to explode over the next decade. So here's what we know. The need for medical exercise mm -hmm. services is going to get bigger and bigger. We see that the growth, demand for uh, uh, growth is going to go well into beyond 2020. Here are the reasons. The population over 50 is going to grow. The baby boomers. The baby boomers generate a huge chunks in the economy. And here's what happens with the baby boomers. At 52, I want to still do what I did at 32 and 22. But I don't want that back pain to bother me. I don't want that arthritic knee or hip to bother me. I want you to give me an exercise that will make it better. Now, my doctors told me I need to slow down, but I still want to play that 18th hole of golf, even though he told me to play nine. That's what he's going to do. So we're going to get more and more. Guess what? The number of total joint replacements is going to grow. Right now we see about three-quarters of a million total hips and total knees being done in the United States alone. Okay? And that's a conservative number. Okay? Someone estimated it's above a million. We're going to see more and more of these. They're, and if you know what's going on in hospitals now, they're putting these things in. Every Tuesday or Thursday you go to any hospital, there are at least four or five of these on the books. Total hips and total knees. The number diagnosed with hypertension and diabetes is going to increase. We're seeing this more and more in young people. They need what? Hypertension and diabetes need what? Diet, medication management, and what else? Exercise. Mm -hmm. I had a, a friend years ago who was an endocrinologist, and I worked at Howard University Hospital. I asked her one day, I said, well, what do you tell your diabetic patients to do as far as exercise? She said, I tell them to go exercise. Well, what exercise do you tell them to do? How much? I just tell them to go exercise. Well, how much do you tell them? Well, I don't know. I just tell them to go exercise. Now, we could say, oh, the physician should know more. Well, actually, that's a godsend for us because now it allows us to step in and provide that service. Mm -hmm. Treatments for osteoarthritis and rheumatoid arthritis will go. Osteoarthritis, please underline that one, is just getting bigger and bigger, which eventually leads to what? Total joint replacements, if not managed appropriately. Number of back surgeries are going to continue to grow. Laminectomies, fusions are increasing. Physical therapy visits, though, are also doing what? Decreasing. Please, if you would write down the number here, 1992. The decrease of physical therapy services started back in 1992. I was in private practice at the time. The idea of nationalized health insurance, when that actually was just simply discussed by the current administration at that time, insurance carriers started to gradually cut back on, on visits then. I spoke for a group of physical therapists a couple weeks ago in Las Vegas. Those that had practiced as long as me all said the same thing. This idea of health insurance cuts, this started decades ago. And it started with the insurance carriers saying, hey, instead of 26 visits for an ACL tear, we're now going to give you 12. And that was one of the things that actually started us, this idea of medical exercise services. But here's what we know. The need for medical exercise is going to continue to grow. We have MESs in Canada, the United States, Europe, all over the world. And all of, us, all of them are telling us the same thing. These things are getting, are increasing or decreasing in the issues of uh, physical therapy visits. Now, it doesn't say that physical therapy isn't effective, it just simply says that the insurance carriers are saying 
we need to give you therapy to get you to a certain point. Now, a supervised exercise program can be helpful. And we are finding that insurance carriers, some insurance carriers are paying for medical exercise mm -hmm. services. So here are some of your opportunities. And we see our MESs and PRCSs, MEPDs working in all these locations. Health clubs, probably the biggest percentage of our uh, MESs work in health club settings. Mm -hmm. Personal mm -hmm. training mm -hmm. studios. If you would, circle personal training studio. There's a prediction I'm going to make here at the end of the uh, presentation. And the prediction is we're going to see less and less personal training studios over the next decade. Yeah. We're going to see more medical exercise training studios. Because for this to really survive, it's going to have to start to align itself with the medical industry to some degree. Physical therapy clinics. Jason Hodge, the president here of Medical Fitness Pros, started in a physical therapy clinic. I know a lot of you have started out working in PT clinics. We're seeing more and more that clinics are actually hiring medical exercise professionals to come in and work with their clients after they finish with physical therapy. Same thing with chiropractic offices. Huge trend now, we're seeing hospital-based fitness centers. Okay? We're seeing these all over the country. The idea now of putting a fitness center in the hospital so medical professionals mm -hmm. can refer. And of course, client homes always is going to be big. And corporate fitness facilities. Please put an asterisk beside this one. We're finding this is getting bigger, not only just simply providing just corporate fitness, but also getting into wellness training and also some medical exercise training for clients that are on workman's comp. They're in what are, what's called light duty statuses. That's just going to get bigger and bigger. Here's what we know. Circle this one. Exercise is the key to long term management of most, not all, most medical conditions. They need an exercise program. What you now have to do is justify the need for the exercise. And if you would, write a couple things down here. This is all based on function. So you might want to write these down. You're going to need to improve their balance, their strength, their endurance, their proprioception, their coordination, stability, muscle fiber recruitment, and power. So let me ask you. We've talked about total joint replacements and back surgery, hypertension, and diabetes. For a client who's had back surgery that also is diabetic, they've been diabetic for 10 years, and they have an arthritic knee, would any of those areas of function I just mentioned, balance, strength, muscle fiber recruitment, stability, be impaired after they've had this knee replacement? Yes or no? Yeah. And we know with physical therapy, just because of changes in our healthcare system and insurance reimbursement, is the therapist going to get this person back to 100%? No. This is where that 80% number comes in. 80% of those individuals are going to need an exercise program. And the key thing, and please write this down, what you're really doing is manage their functional deficits. Medical exercise training really manages the functional deficits. We talked about that a little bit earlier. Those functional deficits are what we're developing the exercise programs to manage. Here's our goal. We eventually want to see an integration of exercise and medicine. We want to see the two communities start to collaborate together, to do more things together. Now, this goal is up to you. You've got to now approach the medical community and tell them what you can do, what your capabilities are, and how well you can do it. And you'll be surprised they're very, very receptive to the idea, extremely receptive. you just got to tell them what to do. And when I say what to do, how to refer. You might want to write these down. How to refer to you. I had an orthopedic surgeon tell me once when I lived in California, he didn't know how to refer to a health club. The reason was he referred his patients for MRIs and CAT scans and certain medical procedures. He had never referred to a health club. Something new. Okay? How do you refer to a health club? Okay? You have to explain them. And also explain who to refer and when to refer them. They don't know. They don't know. So here's a question. How many of you train a doctor? by trainer. In many instances, they don't know all the exercises, and their medical school training doesn't afford them that, doesn't teach them that, which is fine, because at 2 o'clock in the morning, when you go to the emergency room, do you want that physician that examines you to know how to develop an exercise program to improve your gluteal strength or how to manage and figure out what that MRI says? Hey, I want you to figure out how to, what that MRI says and what to do for my uh, abdominal pain. So everybody has a role, and our role is to provide that exercise component, okay? 
This is just going to get bigger and bigger along the way. A couple success stories, okay, to prove it. Sally Davinjay, one of our MESs in Northern Virginia. Sally took the course back in 1998. She took the course, she was a single mother of two, took the course and opened up her own personal training studio, I should say medical exercise studio, at the Racket mm -hmm. Swim and Fitness Club in uh, Burke, Virginia. She now gets referrals from doctors in the Burke community, which is Northern Virginia, does exceptionally well. Our own Jason Hodge here started out in a physical therapy clinic offering personal training and medical exercise services. Now we're in a 4,000 4, square foot, Jason, 4,000 square foot facility, and we're getting referrals from local medical professionals here in the community. David Jilks in the Nanaimo, British Columbia. The company is called uh, Core Essentials. Started out, standard personal training studio, gradually moved toward the medical community, and now I talked to David not too long ago. He has orthopedic surgeons that are referring to him on a regular basis for pre surgery exercise for total hips and total knees. Brian Ritchie, one of our MESs in Washington, D.C. Brian actually is moving to a larger uh, studio in Washington, and I've been to Brian's studio many times. He gets referrals from a couple of the mm -hmm. orthopedic hospitals there in Washington, D.C. for total joint replacements, uh, back surgeries. Susie Dudkey, one of our MESs from Chicago. Susie actually owns now, last time I talked to her, she owned one physical therapy clinic and actually hires therapists to provide physical therapy services on the premises. She started out providing medical exercise services and then expanded. And she's getting bigger and bigger also. Rich Gafter, hopefully Rich is listening in. Rich started out training one-on-one -on -one in Victoria going to homes. Then he actually started contracting into a couple health clubs. Mm -hmm. He now owns a facility. He just moved into a 3,000 square foot facility. They'll actually start next Monday. He has five MESs that work for him, and I've been here several times over the years. They're all busy. We're talking about an average of six to seven clients per day each one sees, and all of these clients are all medically based. He really shifted his paradigm from traditional fitness to medical exercise, and it's just grown and grown. And lastly, Sharon Moyles. She's one of our MESs on Long Island, and she actually started an exercise program in a large health club facility there. They're now getting referrals, and ironically, a couple years ago, the same group that I spoke for, the physical therapy group, one of the therapists in their mastermind group came to me and asked me about our post-rehab programming. She said, well, one of the young ladies in my community finished your program and sent me a brochure, and I sent a client to her, and we kind of worked back and forth on this client. She did a great job. Now I'm sending most of my uh, patients that are discharged to her for the exercise programming. Ironically, she had no idea that I really knew Sharon. Sharon obviously had no idea I knew this therapist. And now they're, she's getting referrals on a regular basis. All to say this, this is going to continue to grow over the next couple of decades. The key things are the following. Will you start to talk to the medical community? Will you talk to them in terms that they understand? And if you would, write this down for me also. You've got to talk in terms they understand from the standpoint of outcomes, okay? Give me an example. A diabetic client. You now have to start talking about glycosylated hemoglobin, okay? A1C. Instead of talking about just simply blood glucose, what is the glycosylated hemoglobin value? That's the value that's used to determine if the exercise in the medical management program really is appropriate. When you start talking that, you're talking apples and apples. The medical community now starts to get it from you. You're now becoming more of a, a, a collaborator with them. Or let's say you're talking about a client after a total hip or a total knee replacement. Why don't we just simply talk about how far they can walk? We now need to start talking about range of motion and function, actually measuring their functional outcomes. Okay? Things along those lines. Clients that have osteoporosis, we now need to start talking about bone density. Is the bone density getting better as a result of our exercise programs? What we need to start to do is become as accountable as the medical community is to these numbers and values. No longer can we just simply say the client's feeling better, they're losing weight, they have more energy. We now need to start saying we can actually measure it. And when we start measuring things, we're going to find insurance carriers are going to like us better, the medical community is going to like us better, but also the clientele out there, the general public is going to like us better. Stop and think about it. This is what we hope to accomplish with this MedEx Pro Summit. Not just this one, but the ones that will come over subsequent years. Suppose we could come up with a way of measuring function after a total knee replacement. Client goes to physical therapy for a period of time to now come to a medical exercise training facility. Brennan Clemson, 
sees eight total knee replacements over the course of the year. He measures their start point and finish point with regard to a functional assessment. It's called a list home scale. What he's able to determine is with these eight clients that have come in with the total knee replacement, on average they see a 32% increase in function over the first 60 days. That's what his research tells him. Okay? Amanda does the same thing in Richmond. She finds that she's getting an improvement of, say, 36% over 60 days. Jason here finds that he's getting an improvement of, say, 28%. When we look at that, a 28% to as high as, a, well, I think I said 36% improvement over 60 days, what if we now could advertise that out there to the public? What do you think would happen to your clientele? You, wouldn't find, you couldn't find enough MESs to work with them. So here's what we're hoping to accomplish over this weekend. And if you would, write these down too. I know I tell you to write down a lot of stuff, but it becomes important. We want to standardize this. The practice of physical therapy, for the most part, is standardized around the world. Practice of nursing, massage therapy to some degree, orthopedics, neurology, oncology. I mean, with little tweaks and little changes here, we now have to standardize this process. So everybody's doing the same thing. We start reporting our outcomes to each other. So now we can start to say this stuff truly does work. We know it works. Now we need to come up with a measurement for it. Okay? That becomes important. We've got to come up with a measurement for it. So the future is bright. And it's going to get bigger and bigger over the next decade. I guarantee you. Your problems are not that you aren't going to have enough clients. Your problems will be, and I find this with our MESs that really go out and really practice the way that they're taught in the course. Your problem is you can't find enough MESs to take care of all the clients that are walking in the door. Because once people start to find out about you and the doctors and therapists, they're going to refer more and more people. Okay, it's just going to get bigger and bigger. I want to read something to you with regard to where I would like for this to go since we're talking about the future. I read this but never, I wrote this, excuse me, but never published it. And if you don't mind, I'm going to read it to you and then we're going to conclude for the evening. The following is a blog post you might see in the not so distant future by a medical exercise program director writing about their first day as the newly appointed medical exercise program director at a major hospital. Quote, today was a great day. It was my first day as the medical exercise program director at Grant Memorial Hospital. I was so excited when I arrived this morning. I trained for the last two years in the medical exercise program director residency program to prepare me for this position. I was the oldest of three candidates for the job, but I got it because of my experience I gained running my own MET studio for four years. Since the Health Care Reform Act was fully implemented by Congress, MESs and MEPDs are hired in clinical and hospital settings all over the country. I'm the first one hired in our city. Though Medicare reimbursement for medical exercise training continues to drop, MET has shown itself to have a huge impact on controlling the rising cost of health care. Now, this blog post is in the year 2022. We're talking about nine years from now. As part of my first day, I attended patient rounds this morning with the chairman of orthopedics, Dr. Shea, the physical therapy director, Marilyn Heed, and the social work director, Jonathan Ellington. I must say I was impressed with their knowledge and understanding of every patient's condition and discharge expectations. Dr. Shea asked for my recommendations on a couple of patients' exercise programs. One in particular, a 73-year-old male gentleman, I'm sorry, 73-year-old gentleman with Parkinson's and a two-day-old hip replacement. It made me realize the importance of my role and the importance of the medical exercise training department here in the hospital. Hospitals now are mandated that all patients have at least one session with the MET department prior to discharge. This usually comes only for patients who have been deemed safe by the physical therapy department for independent ambulation. The patient I mentioned earlier was really interesting. Dr. Shea and the physical therapy director both noted the amazing progress this gentleman made in just two days since surgery. The social worker noted another win for reform. After Dr. Shea acknowledged the patient went through four weeks of MET prior to his surgery, the doctor turned to me and say, said, that's the reason I pushed for hiring you to make MET the standard procedure in conjunction with physical therapy for all pre-total joint replacement patients. The doctor's comment made my day. I realized that I finally reached a goal I established when I became a medical exercise specialist, recognition by the medical community for the outcomes I produced with my clients. Today was the best day of my career. 2022. 
if someone had told me in 1994 that I'd be standing in Houston and doing a medical exercise summit, I'd have told them they were nuts. When I saw those clinics and someone told me I'd be here doing this, I told them they were completely crazy. The world has changed. America has now embraced the idea of fitness. The medical community embraced it. Even insurance carriers are paying for it. And it's just going to get bigger and bigger. So hopefully over the next couple of days we can come up with some standardized guidelines that we can start to use and give you some ideas on how you can build your practice bigger and bigger. If someone had told me that a physical therapist would have allowed a personal trainer to come into their space and rent space from them when I was in private practice in, in the 1990s, I'd have said, no way. I'd have said you were taking something that was crazy. But guess what? Jason Hodge is standing back there and it works. I remember when he called me and told me that they had allowed that. I was like, my goodness, this is going to change. And it's just going to get bigger and bigger. So I'm going to close now. Thank you for coming. Over the next couple of days, we're going to do more and more. And for those of you that are out there listening in, hopefully you'll get your questions answered. Jason, is there a way they can email questions in to us? They can? How do they email the questions in? Why don't we have them just simply email you? Is that okay? Yeah. Okay. Okay. So it's J Hodge, J H O D G E at medicalfitnesspros.com. Correct. All right. So, thank you for joining us this evening. And let me start though. We got a few minutes. Any questions before we close? No. Okay. It's seven o'clock here in Houston, so I know you guys are tired. I know for our staff members, we had a very long, busy week because we're getting busier and busier. And I know for those of you that travel, it's been pretty busy travel day over the last couple of days. So, thank you for joining us. Hopefully over the next couple of days we'll give you a lot of good things that will help. And to those of you out there watching, we wish you the best, and we'll see you tomorrow morning at 9 a.m. Central Time. Now what that is on the West Coast, that's what, 7 a.m.? And then back east is 10 a.m. So we'll see you tomorrow. Thanks again. Good night.